Welcome to this episode of the Skip Meetings Podcast, a podcast for curious professionals embracing the future of business events. My name is Miguel Neves, and I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Skiff Meetings. And in this episode, I have the pleasure of speaking with David Peckinpah, the President and CEO of Maritz Holdings. The episode is titled Unleashing Human Potential, because this is one of the initiatives within Maritz, and I asked David about how he actually puts this into practice. We talk about some of the challenges he's having in reorganizing the Maritz brand into one company, and we talk about how Maritz manages its workforce and how it's helping its clients in dealing with remote and hybrid workforce setups. We talk about innovation and design and how that's constantly a part of how Maritz works. And we talk about why David feels that airlines should engage more with the meetings industry. I hope you enjoy listening to this conversation and I invite you to check out the other episodes of the podcast. You can find them on our website or by subscribing through your favorite podcast service. Hello, everybody. Welcome to this episode of the Skiff Meetings podcast. I am delighted to be with uh, David Peckinpah, the CEO of Maritz. Uh, thank you, David, for making time to be with us today. Hey, thank you for the invitation. My pleasure. I say with David virtually in this case, but we will be together on stage at the Skiff Meetings Forum in September. So I'm looking forward to that conversation. So I thought I'd start um, by really getting um, a little bit of an intro uh, to David and David, I know you've been in the industry something like 30 years. You've been with Merits for a long part of that as well. I don't want to you know, give exact dates or anything like that, but uh, you've had a really interesting journey. So I, I wonder if you could give us in your own words, a succinct kind of um, tour of that journey, if you will. And I'd love to start by when you first became aware of the industry. I think a lot of people sure. aren't necessarily, you know, during their studies, et cetera, aren't necessarily aware of events and kind of meetings as an industry. So if you could start there and kind of take us to the present day, uh, that would be great. Yeah. And I don't know if we have enough time for that, because uh, as you mentioned, it's been a long, long career so far. <laughs> but uh, I'm one of the the ones in the industry that sort of fell into it. It was not planned. Uh, I really had originally planned to be an attorney. Had applied to law school, was planning to go to law school, life events happened. And instead of doing that, I took two years off and was a, a sail bum for a year and a ski bum for a year. And then uh, joined a family business for a few years. Knew that was not right for me and moved back to Colorado. I went to Colorado College for uh, my undergraduate. And, and what is the family business, just out of curiosity? Well, it was it's really boring. It was a manufacturer's representative company uh with uh ferrous and non-ferrous metals <laughs> okay so it Should was know. not my cup of tea but i tried you know my dad was an attorney and had this business on the side and uh I, I gave it the old college try but it was just not the right fit for me moved to colorado was put in touch with someone at the broadmoor hotel and uh, this is 1984 that's probably the only date i'll give you to so it's been almost 40 years now uh and uh they were hiring the first ever outside sales force. And so I was the first sales manager hired at the Broadmoor and that started my career. I was at the Broadmoor. I went to La Costa out in California, back to Cheyenne Mountain Conference Resort. Uh, then I, I joined Hyatt Hotels in Denver, San Diego, Long Beach. And then my last hotel was MGM Grand. Uh, I was vice president of sales and marketing out there. Um, and then I got into the third party world. Um, so late 90s joined a company called Confron that became Experient. And I'll tie all this in. Um, was there for eight years, then uh, went back to California uh, and ran the Convention Visitors Bureau in San Diego. And then was recruited, uh, spent some time with Helms Briscoe, uh, developing some new uh, markets for them, and then was recruited to Merits 12 years ago. And wow. so I've really been a, it's been a very unusual journey. It's not one, perhaps I would recommend everybody, but it's, uh, it's worked well for me. And, and I always came with that philosophy of, you know, when an opportunity opened, I wanted to explore that. And if it made sense, I'd, I'd take the, the, the leap. Um, after my wife and I had children later in life, we'd been married 12 years before we had our first child. Then things slowed down a little bit and I didn't make as many moves, but I moved quite a bit and made a lot of changes early in my in my career. So I've done the hotel uh, part, third party part, and then the convention visitor visitor bureau uh, part as well. So 
uh, kind of unusual, but it's also served me well because I have that well-rounded background really of every segment. I was going to say, I think would you, you've pretty much covered all the typical kind of components <laughs> of the industry. Are there yeah. any areas that you would have, would have liked to have explored more or you're curious about kind of learning more about? You know, I, the one thing I look back and, and during my stint at the MGM, I also oversaw catering and which was somewhat of a joke because I was not a foodie and it was more sort of operational focused, but I do look back and go, I wish I had spent more time on the culinary side. Uh, Cause as I've, you know, grown older and, and really appreciated the culinary arts uh, to a much greater degree, I wish I had a deeper knowledge of, of, of food and beverage. Um, and that would have, probably been once one area of the career I wish I had uh, gone deeper in but I was really a sales guy and and the operations uh, side of the of the business especially the hotel side just and that didn't really appeal to me which is why I didn't go down that path that makes sense so let's talk a little bit about merits I mean merits is also a, a connection or a conjunction of different companies I know <laughs> I believe yeah. that you're kind of really really merging now and becoming one global kind of organization with all these different facets. But can you give us a short overview of the different companies and sort of the, the history that, that brings Merits all together? Yeah, I will, uh, I will again try to be as succinct as I can. So Merits is 130 years old um, shortly. So uh, in the fourth generation of ownership from the Merits family and Steve Merits is our owner and He's the chairman of our board. Uh, Steve appointed me uh, CEO about a year and a half ago, January 1st of 22. And you're the uh, first non-family member to be CEO. First, yeah, first non-family member. So no pressure. Uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> basically, he basically gave me keys to the car and said, don't crash it. So I'm, I'm <laughs> doing my best not to do that. Uh, but over the years, you know, Merits has innovated and evolved, uh, as you can imagine, many different times. Uh, up until recently, uh, we've really been a holdings company. So we've uh, had that mindset of a holdings company with separate business units. And those business units were Merits Global Events, Merits Motivation, and Merits Automotive. And what I did after I, I took over uh, this new role is embarked on about a, almost an eight-month process that we called Next 125. We were playing off our 125th anniversary that uh, happened a few years ago. And how do we how do we revision the company uh, so that we're around for another 125 years and hopefully even longer? And so that led to a lot of uh, self discovery. Uh, we did an immense no amount of research. We spent almost four months doing research, uh, talking to past employees, to clients, past clients, a lot of focus groups. Uh, I think we did over 180 interviews uh, and got a diverse uh, set of data sets that then informed uh, our decision. And so we're in the process now, we're early stages, uh, but really uh, clarifying our brand in the marketplace. And we're gonna be going to market as just merits. Uh, so we're getting rid of the business unit model and we're going to one company, one brand. Uh, I think everyone that refers to us has always referred to us as merits. Uh, I think we were trying to impose our internal structure on the marketplace versus really being uh, more welcoming to the marketplace and being easier to do business with. And I think that's what this new singular brand will allow us to do. So we're in the process of that. I've redesigned my leadership team. Uh, actually our first uh, new leadership team meeting is next Monday. Uh, so uh, really early stages in this evolution where uh, it's gonna take pretty much the rest of our fiscal year to go through rebranding, uh, re, uh, redesign of the website, uh, you know, just getting people to used to new vernacular, if you will, uh, among the business. But that's the that's the fun of change. Uh, but we're we're doing all this because we're focused on number one, the client. What are our clients' needs, and how do we satisfy those needs? Uh, number two is how do we take care of our people and create a really interesting career and career pathing for our people and a culture that is really enriching and empowering. And uh, and, uh, and we also wanna make sure we're taking care of our supplier partners. And we think this clarity of brand is gonna help all that and ultimately drive growth. Um, that's the number one thing is we need long-term sustainable growth uh, in order to achieve all those previous goals. I'm really happy to hear you say about the uh, not imposing the company structure on uh, the clients and the public in general. I think that is a, 
in my mind, a mistake that a lot of companies do. You see that on websites, you see that in marketing materials, you know, it really doesn't matter which department someone's at, do they, can they help you, right? Can, can they, can they help you get what you want? I think that's sort of the, the big question. For the well, and and Merit's is such a powerful brand that I think the clarity of that is uh, empowering to everybody. And, and the reaction internally has been really strong. I think people love it. They're, you know, with any kind of change, people are a little bit skittish and, and afraid, but I think we're trying to be very transparent, trying to be very open in the process. Uh, this is all about, um, you know, empowering our workforce so that we can grow. And and I think that's an exciting story to share. Absolutely. I wondered if you could share some examples, uh, obviously no, no company secrets, but any examples of what you thought was surprising, maybe, of how the different companies and different departments work that you actually, you know, had to work harder at that than maybe you would expect. Because I can, I think it's relatively obvious to me, I think that automotive events and the type of events that that sector might be doing compared to global events might be different and yeah. you know like the clients are different but in terms of the inner workings you know it, 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 in, a, in a kind of simple sense it sounds like oh this should be easy you just sort of set it up but what were the some of the surprising things that you had to work harder on than you maybe thought you would yeah i think um a couple things one is the technology uh, side of the business uh we have uh, a very, you can imagine with all those different business units. And at one point, I don't know, probably 13, 14 years ago, we had seven business units. So uh, Steve sold a couple off and then consolidated a couple others. So it's over over time, because of that, our, our IT infrastructure became very complex. And, uh, and it still is complex. And it's one that's going to take a while to unwind. Uh, but we've got a great team that is on top of that and and is going to get us through that. But that's a multi-year process as we work through sort of that untangling of interconnected uh, technology that you know was serving different parts of the of the enterprise. Uh, the second surprise to me was was really around culture. Um, you know, you would think because we're all part of one you know overall merits that the cultures would be very similar. And I think as we embarked on the next 125 initiative, the uniqueness of culture in each of the businesses really came to life. And so we really took that to heart and said, okay, we can't lose some of those really important elements that are, are critical to employees of the motivation company or our auto um, company, and but blend that all into a singular uh, culture that's going to work for everybody. <clears throat> so I think, you know, those are two things. And then I, I, uh, I do think we, we overall have very distinct buying audiences, but in some instances, there's significant overlap. And I think that's one of the things we try to, we are going to uh, maximize uh, as we look at those market opportunities is there, there's a lot more similarity between our buying audiences than perhaps we thought. And now we need to make sure that we take advantage of that. Really interesting. I read some things in, in your bio and, and the kind of the company culture, core values. I think two things really stood out to me. You have this concept of first take good care of each other, which I think speaks to this idea of well-being and wellness and kind of making sure that you have a, a healthy workforce rather than a stressed and overworked workforce. I don't think that helps anyone. Uh, and yeah. you also have this idea of unleashing human potential. Uh, and you mentioned company culture already so, I wonder, already, so I wonder if you could expand on those two things a little bit. Sure. Well, first of all, I, unfortunately, I think coming out of what we've all experienced the last few years, we do have an overworked and stressed workforce. I, I, I don't want to paint a Pollyannish picture of what we're all going through. It's still a very difficult environment. It's exciting because the business is back and roaring back and uh, as busy as ever. But the workforce has changed. Uh, you know, we have a significant number of new employees that are part of the organization because of, unfortunately, what we had to go through. So there's a lot of still stress uh, within the organization, but we've not lost uh, our focus on our core value, which is first taking care of each other. And that's one of the core values that existed in Merit's Global Events. Now we're going to be in the process of, of uh, really broadening, broadening that across all of Merit's. Um, but I think, you know, for us, it's a, stake, it's a four stakeholder model. It's first and foremost, our employees, it's our clients, it's our um, supplier partners, and then it's the communities that we operate in. And we use that as a filter, really, in every decision that we make is 
are we taking good care of our suppliers? Are we taking good care of our employees? Are we taking great care of, of our clients? And then uh, obviously the communities in which we either live and operate in or do events in. Uh, and so that's really uh, critical to us. And, and what I've always enjoyed as a leader uh, is having a core value that everyone, that it, it resonates with them. And, you know, if you walk the halls of our company, uh, I would bet a high, high percentage of our employees would be able to at least tell you that one core value. And we we call it our central core value. And I think that's important. Uh, I think uh, now we get called on the carpet at times, as you can imagine, um, is like, OK, you did made that decision that didn't take care of of that individual or that situation. And uh, we have to take that to heart. We need that feedback. Uh, but it is something that we really do strive for. And. If you look at what we do, you know, we're a company that empowers and inspires people to drive better business results. I mean, that really, no matter what uh, audience we're talking to, whether it's an auto a client, it's a, uh, it's an incentive program for an employee program, or it's a travel program. At the end of the day, that's what it's about, in engaging and inspiring people to drive better business results. And, and that, to me, is all about unleashing human potential. And so we as an industry, I have a unique opportunity to touch people uh, emotionally. Uh, we can change behavior and impact behavior, and thus we can change results for the organizations that are investing in these programs. And so we've really simplified it down into unleashing human potential. Every opportunity we have to interact with one of our clients' guests is an opportunity to unleash their potential. And and we take that to heart and we uh, put that into our design practice uh, uh, and it's core to everything that we do is as we look at how do we do that how do we if we're planning one of our own internal events how do we look at that as an opportunity with each of the audiences there to truly help unleash their potential no matter what that is and everyone is unique everyone is different so we have to design with that sort of um, a mass customization in mind, if you will, uh, when you're dealing with with events and event design. I think these these missions and values, I think they're they're very important with with all companies. Um, yeah, do you have any examples that come to mind of this idea of unleashing human potential? You know, because it it, it sounds like a big mission that can apply to very, absolutely everyone in every situation. Very uh, esoteric, for sure. Exactly. But do you have any examples that come to mind of I don't know, somebody that's changed roles or somebody that you'd really helped either a client or internally or anyone where you can really kind of synthesize that into a concrete example? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, I, I I go back to a client, I won't use the client name, uh, but the, the client contact was one of the early um, uh, clients that embarked on a design journey with us. Uh, we started our design practice back in 2011. Uh, Jim Gilmore, the author of Experience Economy, uh, worked with us as we built out that practice. Greg Bogue is, uh, is, was the key architect of that. And this client that I'm thinking of uh, really embarked on that journey with us very early. And uh, then eventually down the road became an employee uh, because he was so moved by, uh, by the results. But uh, we worked with that organization. It was a sales conference. Uh, it was a organization that was struggling culturally, particularly around their sales organization. Leadership was seen as uh, distracted, disconnected, um, not in tune. Uh, and we put them through our, our design lab and the results were remarkable. And you know, when this individual talks about it, he, he tears up every time. It's, it's amazing the impact that it had on him and his career and his life. But then the stories he tells about the sales leader and how it had changed his behavior and how he changed how he interacted with the sales force, little things that they did at that first kickoff conference that have then taken on a life of their own and made a significant difference, impacted business results, right? Sales went through the roof, culture changed, leadership, respect changed, and trust within that leadership uh, and that team uh, changed. So to me, that's a very concrete example of because of our work with that client hand in hand, uh, collaboratively going through a design process, uh, unleash the potential of that leader, of that sales organization, and ultimately of our client contact that is still on that journey with us. 
uh, not no, no longer as an employee, but as a uh, as a regular participant in uh, in client work and our own events. Very interesting. Thank you for sharing that. You mentioned already a little bit about company culture. Just curious about how Maritz is working on the remote working side of things. How are you dealing with the people in the office uh, working yeah. from home? What kind of freedom are you are you giving your employees? Yeah, it's interesting. I did a, a presentation of oh, six or nine months ago to the whole company, and we did a heat map of where our employees were based 10 years ago and where our employees are based today. And 10 years ago, we were very uh, concentrated around where we had physical offices, as you can imagine. A heavy concentration in St. Louis. We had you know, offices in Southern California and the East Coast, uh, Detroit, Ohio, and that was everything was concentrated around that. Now you look at the heat map and it is completely dispersed. Uh, we have a very decentralized workforce. Number of employees, our headquarters are in St. Louis. Number of employees that we have in the headquarter area is, is greatly reduced. Um, and with that comes challenges and also great opportunity. The opportunities we've been able to really change how we recruit and find talent and bring talent into the organization. Uh, it's helped with our DEI efforts. It's helped with uh, upgrading our skill sets uh, and finding, you know, you know, frankly, better talent. Um, now we've lost a lot of great talent, unfortunately, and and you know we would love to get everyone back if we could, but uh, you know people made other decisions and moved on. Um, but I think you know the the challenge of building and maintaining a culture in that environment is really tough. Uh, I believe it was the CEO of Google uh, had a phrase that I really grabbed onto, which is encouraging people to come back into the workforce has to be a magnet, not a mandate. And so I've really, that really resonated with me as we were, you know, coming out of the pandemic and, and struggling with uh, how to manage this decentralized workforce. And we've had remote workers for, you know, decades. So that model was not new, but uh, without that concentration of employees that could be physically together uh, has created a whole new set of challenges. So I think, looking at what we can do to be a magnet to get people, if they are near an office location, to come in and engage. I think people naturally want to do that. Uh, we do not have a mandate uh, at the company, and um, and we have great participation, live in-person participation, because people want that human connection. But it also doesn't make sense to force somebody to commute an hour and a half each day in order just to make that happen. So we put a lot of programs in. We've launched a new employee recognition reward program called Confetti. Um, I've stepped up the communications. Uh, we now have regularly scheduled town halls, all company town halls, whether you're there in person or remote. Uh, I do a monthly uh, video newsletter uh, where I try to update everyone on what's going on and, uh, and key initiatives within the company. Uh, we have our internal intranet, uh, my merits that uh, we really spend a lot of time and energy to make sure that critical information is there for everyone to to garner. And then we take advantage of our uh, industry events, right? We are heavily participating in IMEX, uh, both Frankfurt and IMEX America. Uh, so we have a sales meeting around that conference. Um, so we look at those opportunities. We also have our own events, Activate, Elevate. Uh, we have a customer advisory board. Uh, we have our own internal incentive programs. Those are all ways to gather our teams, remote teams all together in person. Uh, and then that allows us to continue to build and reinforce our culture. So it's it's a it's a challenge. It's a multifaceted um, you know, approach that uh, is making sure that we're doing the best we can. But we're, you know, we're still early on uh, in that journey and learning like everyone else. But fortunately, it's what we do, right? We're a people and performance company and uh, and it's sort of part of our DNA and how we interact and 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 treat our people and build culture. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I believe that you're also working with clients to help them do that, right? To help them have magnets that attract people to physical locations. Can Correct. you share a little bit about, uh, I guess, what you're being asked to do and, and yeah. I don't know, part of the design process of, of how do you get there? Yeah, we, uh, we have a pretty, uh, I think, robust practice um, around uh, the the work, excuse me, the workplace experience, and uh, we've got 
several clients, uh, one particularly large technology company uh, that has a big physical footprint uh, around the country and around the globe. And we've been engaged with them for several years now in uh, managing all of their meetings uh, and their meetings are all on campus. They're not, they're not room night related overnight programs, but day meetings, uh, vast majority of them. And they're like 28, 29,000 uh, of those events a year. Um, so the volume is huge. And again, that's where, you know, I think it make, making uh, events a magnet uh, versus having a mandate uh, really works. And so we've worked diligently uh, with that client, with our design practice to see what are those elements that would engage an employee and encourage them to come back, be on campus, to be engaged face-to-face uh, -face, uh, whenever possible. And so I think you, you hear me talk about design a lot, and I think that is at the essence of everything that we're doing. It's why uh, these clients are selecting us as a partner uh, because of that design expertise and design practice. And uh, we've got a pretty amazing uh, program that we work with clients on in a very collaborative way uh, that gets down to what are their core values, what are their core missions, what are their core business objectives, and then how do we design to help them achieve each and every one of those. And the results of that are transformational. Um, it's pretty remarkable, uh, the results that we get and the clients get, and, and it's been really good for our business, and it's been really good for our clients as well. Really interesting. Thank you for sharing that. I think it's um I think it's a fascinating trend, right? Because this idea that uh we we're sort of familiar with a lot of different types of events, this kind of kickoff call or kickoff uh, conference, different types of events that are sort of customer with with uh, large companies. But it seems like this return to the office is a new category that uh, that yeah. sort of has its own needs and has its own kind of design uh, journey, if you will. Yeah, I mean the, the workplace experience is um I mean, it's an internal practice of ours now. It's been in place for almost four years. Um, so we're, again, we're really well situated to do that because we have all the kind of programs that you can use to recognize and reward employees, to to um, incentivize them, whether it's through a points-driven program or a travel program. Um, that's the history of merits. And so we've been really well positioned to, to help companies deal with their challenges uh, that they're facing in this new environment. And, you know, you see a lot of different stories about some companies are changing their tune and they're now making everyone come back on campus or into the office. Um, you know, it's a mixed bag. Uh, and I think every company has to come up with their own decision and what works for them and their culture and, and based on their values and, and how they're going to um, nurture their employee base. Uh, and so I, I don't think there's one right answer. I think it has to be right for you as, as the individual leader in the organization. Absolutely. You, you mentioned already uh, the design processes that you have, and I know that you're working on something new or, or you've worked on it, but you're sort of fine tuning it still. And I think it's something that Greg's been working on. Tell us a little bit about this kind of new design process or new design initiative. Um, and I, I assume that you're already using it with some of the clients. Yeah. I mean, it's the, the, the practice has been, again, we started with Greg and Jim Gilmore and others back in 2011. So it has a natural evolution to it. So uh, it is constantly changing. So the, you know, what we do today is very different than what we were doing six months ago or a year ago. And, and that's based on, you know, iterative design. Um, you know, we've got a pretty robust innovation practice. That innovation practice then informs design. We have a robust data uh, decision sciences practice. That data then informs uh, design. And so everything feeds into that, uh, which then drives uh, the evolution of that practice. Uh, and now we have, uh, you know, new entrants like AI, um, which, you know, has been around for a while, but is suddenly in the last six months or so really exploded, obviously, with chat GBT and, and, uh, and all the dialogue that's going on with that, but AI and virtual reality has been around for a while. Uh, and we've embraced that, uh, through our innovation practice and, and then our design practice. So, um, you know, we're, we use our own events, uh, as our, our beta test sites and Guinea and sort of our Guinea pigs. Uh, and we have two events coming up, uh, this summer and fall elevate and activate one is a supplier event. The other is a client event. Uh, and we uh, roll out new initiatives, new 
uh, new ideas and uh, new design concepts at those conferences. And, and so we hope uh, we uh, surprise and delight our audiences. Uh, they're, they always know it's a bit of an experiment. And so I think there's a, a little bit of grace that is given yep. to us uh, last year at, at well, our last conference called Next And. Uh, we tried to really shake up the model. There was no keynote address. Uh, I did an opening address on video and that was sent out in advance. Uh, so we're constantly looking at ways to to engage audiences in different ways and make, uh, you know, I think the the one, and I give Greg credit for this, Greg Bug, uh, is we want to make sure that when we're together, we're doing things that we can only do when we're together and we can't do when we're apart. And so that to me is the challenge of event design is how do you make sure that the time is really well spent, that the investment of that time is worth it, and that you are doing things that can only be done in person, can't be done like we're doing today remotely, uh, screen to screen versus face to face. So we had Greg on the Experience Design Summit that we had, I think at the end of last year, and he talked about that event and convincing yeah. you to do a, a video address, I think was that was an interesting part of that conversation. Yeah, you know, and it, and it worked great. And I probably got more commentary and feedback on that during the event than it had I done it live. I mean, it's, I don't know what that says about me or my ability to speak. But <laughs> I think, well, you yeah. know, we're always trying to, to shake it up. And, and, you know, people learn differently, they, um, they devour content differently. And we've got to be ahead of that curve constantly. Absolutely. And Greg mentioned the uh, to you, with you, by you kind of evolution of the design. I think that's yeah. what you were saying as well, that idea yeah. that really keeping the participants at the center of whatever you do at in the person. Absolutely. Events. And, and it creates a whole nother set of challenges, right? Because, uh, you know, the old cut and paste agenda, fortunately, hopefully that has died years ago, but that still exists. Mm -hmm. And really co-creating, uh, not only with your, your client partners, but then with your attendees. Uh, yep. is really a powerful, powerful concept. And that's where we're constantly experimenting with and we'll be doing more of that in our events coming up. Interesting to hear. So I want to touch on two kind of uh, topics that are a bit wider uh, uh, on the industry. And then I want to cover some of the challenges in the industry with you because I'd sure. love to get your thoughts on these. But uh, I think you also mentioned uh, a little bit about the what, what makes merits merits. And I think sustainability is increasingly a part of what makes merits merits and i think um let's not beat around the bush right sustainability and uh motivating people to travel internationally to events they're quite uh you know they're quite far apart i think there's there's a there's an argument to say that um we are promoting a lot of travel that doesn't necessarily have to happen but on the other side we want to use the magic of that in-person gathering how do you kind of bring this all together because i think you want to make sure that sustainability and the future of everybody is 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 at stake and is you're mindful of that but you also want to make a business make money right i mean it's it's a it's a tricky thing for our industry right because we're in the business of gathering people what we found i think as an industry during the the pandemic was that while technology is a great way to remain connected um it really is not a replacement for in person events and i think that's why we see even with some of the you know the rumblings of a, a possible economic slowdown we're not seeing that at all on the business event side of the of uh, of the enterprise and and so i think people are, are all in 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 person events uh, you certainly still have hybrid components and virtual components but that is the essence of what we do and how we do it so now it's how do we become a responsible uh, citizen of the globe and participate in environmental strategy in ways that makes a difference. You know, we're signed on to a carbon neutral um, pact by 2050. We've got uh, Rachel Riggs as our environmental strategy leader, uh, reporting to Ben Godegaver. Ben is our global uh, leader and uh, leading both our uh, environmental strategy and our DEI efforts. And all are really important about being a global citizen. Um, and it's also becoming a business imperative. Right, our clients expect us uh, to have initiatives uh, that meet their own standards and needs, and we have our own standards and requirements of who we work with and our supplier base. And so, I think it's that collaboration as an industry to to work towards um, solutions that make sense. Uh, I think is is really a logical path forward. You see airlines going to biofuels. 
Um, that's really exciting. That's going to make a big difference. More efficient airplanes is going to make a significant difference. Um, but we've got to continue that path. And I don't think we have all the answers now, but I am encouraged on the path that we're on and the ability that as an industry, we can get to that carbon neutral uh, positioning sooner than later. Uh, I think 2050 seems like a long way out. It's probably not, it's going to go, you know, certainly it's going to go past my career and possible life. Uh, but uh, I think we can get there sooner um, with the right uh, concentration of of the brains that we have in this industry and the uh, and the initiatives that we have underway uh, that I think are going to help us solve that. So I think we've got to be part of the discussion. We can't be defensive, and we've got to uh, activate ourselves uh, so that we are driving the decisions uh, forward and not being the recipients of decisions that we're not going to like. And that's why I think you know initiatives coming out of meetings mean business or uh, ice or other uh, you know initiatives are really important because we need to be driving these solutions and and not being uh, reactive but being proactive. Do, do you ever see that you know virtual events or not gathering people in person is part of the solution that Maritz would propose? Oh yeah, I mean I think we we still have a virtual practice. Um, it's died down quite a bit over the last two years. Uh, but we're we're not ignoring that at all. And, you know, we have uh, some really interesting AI initiatives underway and and uh, have already rolled out a VR initiative uh, around trade shows and a way to extend the life of trade shows in a very unique way. So we're not we're not ignoring that at all. I do think um, as we see technology evolve, you've started to see holographic um uh, approaches at events uh, in order to bring in, you know, usually it's one or two people, it's not a whole audience, but, you know, I think technology is going to continue to evolve and and bring new options to us. Um, and so I think we have to keep, you know, our eyes and ears open on that. But right now, uh, I, I still think the in-person uh, event is, is king. Uh, it's what people want. It's where they get the greatest value and it's where their investment of time has the greatest return. You mentioned AI already a few times. I wanted to get uh, any more details that you have or any sense of expectation of where you expect it to go. I mean, it's it's developing at such a rapid rate, so I'm not expecting you to have the, the exact crystal yeah, ball, but I'd love to hear your yeah. uh, your thoughts on that. Yeah, we've, uh, we've spent the last year uh, with our innovation team and our technology teams really trying to understand the landscape. As I said, we've been involved in various aspects for quite a while, but uh, the evolution of it has been so fast over the last six to nine months. Um, we have a board meeting coming up in August, and we have a, a whole session uh, at that board meeting uh, dedicated just to AI and the impacts on the business. You know, we have a lot of internal uh, processes and client-facing processes that are really ripe for um, AI intervention. Uh, you know, we've, we do a lot of bot work. We do a lot of... Um, of different functions that can probably be automated or should be automated uh, and then free up our teams to do other things that are more uh, impactful for our clients. Uh, and that's what we're looking at. So we're, you know, like everyone else, we, we've we looked at web 3.0, we've looked at, you know, what are the impacts of various different things on our business? Um, we took those to our client advisory board uh, in January and got a lot of great client feedback. Uh, but we're early in this journey, I think, like everyone else is. And so we're looking at it both internally and externally. And how do we bring the greatest value of using um, some of the new technologies to advantage ourselves and our clients? Absolutely. I think that's a, a great position to be in and trying to figure things out, right? Kind of. Yeah, that was my uh, my subtle way of saying we're, we're still, uh, like everyone else, trying to figure it out. Absolutely. I think we all are. So I wanted to kind of go bigger picture um, and talk about some of the challenges uh, in the industry. And I, I correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that commissions are not something that Merits relies on heavily. I don't know if at all. I, I remember speaking to Steve O'Malley about this and he was saying that it's yeah. something that was kind of not so much part of the picture as, as with other companies. And you mentioned some third parties, et cetera. I don't know if that's a challenge that you talk about a lot, but maybe let's start there, but also cover any kind of big challenges that you're seeing ahead. We've discussed sustainability and a few other things, but um, of course there's, I'm sure there are things that worry you more than others. 
Yeah, I think you know the the commission model uh, was ripe for change. We've known that for a long time. Uh, so when Marriott um, made their change, I've lost track of what year it was, 2019 or somewhere in there. Um, you know, we were prepared for that. Uh, we've got different sides of our business that use commissions in different ways, but uh, that has evolved uh, and evolved significantly over uh, the pandemic because if you weren't doing events, uh, you didn't have hotel rooms being consumed and you didn't have commissions. So we've changed our business model significantly. It had already changed on the corporate side of our business, but uh, then it evolved much more on the association side. So, uh, and we, we still, um, you know, feel that commissions are earned, uh, they are deserved, and uh, our hotel partners realize that and recognize that and support those. Uh, but it can't be your only revenue source. And, and so how we treat those commissions uh, is is very different, uh, I think, than most or many other companies, I should probably say, not most. Um, and so we've, we've embraced that. Uh, we realized it was coming. Uh, we really uh, spent a lot of time talking and interacting with our supplier partners to understand what their pain points were, where their needs were, and, and really partnered. Uh, and I think that's been our approach is we weren't going to fight it. We were going to say, how do we collaborate and make it work for all of us? So I think that's kind of where we are. We're in a very steady state. Uh, I think we've got great relationships with our supplier partners. Our clients and customers understand uh, that environment. and. Uh, and I think uh, we're, you know, it's it's a, again a work in progress, but I think we're very content with where we are at this juncture. Um, you don't know what's going to happen down the road, but we're keeping an eye on it. Would you be able to share a rough kind of number of the, you know, how much of your revenue comes from commissions or anything to give no, us an idea of that? Um, I off the top of my head, that would be really tough because we have so many different revenue sources. Um, mm -hmm. It's it's a part of the business mix, but it's not a majority by any means. So we're talking under ten percent, maybe something like that. Oh no, it's more than that. But um, it's then it's how you how those commissions are treated and what the relationship is with the client. Okay, interesting. Well, thank you for sharing. But yeah, I would like to open up to any other challenges that you're seeing, and you're kind of like you know how you're actually addressing these. Um, is AI? Are you seeing AI as a challenge? Are you seeing the the staffing? issues that we've seen the last couple of years uh, to be a continued challenge, anything keeping yeah. you up at night? Yeah, I think the the biggest, I mean, AI, I think is an opportunity. You know, I think you can look at it in both ways, but we look at it as an opportunity. How do we maximize that for use uh, to benefit our people, our employees and our clients? Um, so we're excited about that. We're, we're um, our innovation practice again is really pushing that envelope. And, uh, and so we we're we're excited about the implications that can have for for our business, uh, you know, I think the number one challenge, and I don't think it's anything new, is uh, talent. Right, it's the acquisition of talent, the retention of talent, uh, the ability to afford talent. Um, so, if, if there's one thing that is front and center with me all the time, it's around our people. Uh, and you know, obviously, we're a professional services organization. Our people are our assets. They walk in and out our doors every day. And they're critical to our customer relationships, our supplier relationships, and uh, but it's it's a tricky environment. The great resignation, I think, that has settled down uh, quite a bit. We don't see nearly the amount of movement that we had just like eighteen to twenty four months ago. Uh, but the cost of talent has gone up significantly, um, is outstripping revenue growth um, for the most part, and that creates a business challenge. So how do we continue to make sure that we're getting the right people in the organization, we're keeping and retaining those people, recognizing, rewarding their efforts, uh, providing career pathing and career growth uh, for those people and have what we've enjoyed for many, many, many generations, which is long-term, empowered, happy, fulfilled employees. And, and that's our number one goal, uh, but it's tricky. You know, it's... Uh, you know, we're in a, an environment where we're not selling widgets, where I can change the price of a widget today and see the benefit of that within 30 days. You know, we have long-term contracts. Um, we, we're not, we don't have that kind of price uh, flexibility uh, that other industries do. And so we've got to work within those realities. Uh, so that's, to me, the number one challenge. Uh, and then I think you've already covered some, which is the whole environmental strategy, the impact of, of uh, sustainability, DE&I, 
uh, what that means long term for the business uh, and how do we engage in that conversation and be proactive versus reactive, which I already covered. Well, thank you. So thank you for going there. Um, can I, can to... I throw in one other, one other, of course, yeah. one other challenge that I do think is front and center is the airlines. Um, I think we Tell me more. So, well, I think sometimes we tend to, and even some of the airlines don't even consider themselves part of the events industry or hospitality, right? They're a transportation, uh, an intermodal, um, uh, solution. We've seen some change in that, but obviously the travel experience right now is really tough. Uh, you know, we survey virtually every event and all of our guests and, uh, the number one challenge they have is with the airline. It's the scheduling, it's the ticketing, it's the customer service, it's the experience. Uh, it's tough. Um, I mean, it's it's a tough environment. And I think our industry is, you know, we've already talked about the environmental aspect of it, but if we can't get people in the air, we can't get people to the events, it is really critical. And so it's good to see the airlines engaging in meeting to meet business. I think that's a real positive. Um, and we need to continue to reach out and work with the airlines uh, so that their model is is healthy, but starts focusing more and more on the customer experience because it's tough out there, and uh, and it's it it can be really exhausting for the traveler. Absolutely, I think a lot of us are are feeling that or have had experiences. I think my my colleague Andrea Doyle was on the way to DI and had a nine hour delay, I believe, something like that. So uh, uh, yeah. it's a tough one. But you mentioned kind of airlines getting a bit more involved. What would that look like ideally? Because I, I can kind of see it from both sides. I don't know how involved airlines normally are into the different kind of, uh, I yeah. guess, sectors or way, you know, feeding uh, the airline industry. But what would you think that ideally would look like? Yeah, I think, you know, we're we're an interesting um, incubator for the because we still have an internal uh, guest services organization that does uh, airline ticketing. Uh, we don't outsource that as part of our uh, sort of our DNA. Um, and so we're actively involved with all the airlines and, and you can go brand by brand by brand. And, and I could tell you, um, who's engaged in the events and who is not. And one of the major carriers made a big decision, uh, in the last few months to move out of the events, uh, space. They really disbanded their sales force, uh, no longer have really a focus on, on group and group travel, uh, because they're reacting to the current environment, which is all about leisure. Right. And the leisure traveler, uh, while books books much shorter and as far as a booking window, uh, typically is at a higher rate. And so the airlines are enjoying that. But we have a couple other examples of other airlines that have really gone all in on group at void and seen the benefits of that. So um, even some airlines, and I'll, I will mention one like Southwest. Southwest is traditionally not uh, focused much on the group segment. And we're seeing a change uh, and a sea change with them. Uh, and they're engaging, um, I think, much more in that. So I think their recognition of the power of group travel, uh, what it can mean, you know, you can get those blocks um, booked far in advance. It gives them that base of business that they can then uh, build on. Um, and there's a lot of advantage to it. Uh, and the list could go on and on and on. So uh, I see one is their just recognition of the power of group travel. And two is engaging in the industry, whether it's at uh, industry events like ASAE, PCMA, uh, MPI, you know, that list goes on uh, and and critical organizations like Meeting Means Business, which is part of U.S. Travel Association now. Um, and several of the airlines are now um, a member of that organization. So that's, I think, really positive signs of of several airlines really engaging and seeing the value of our our market segment. That's really interesting. I definitely think we should expand that more at the, at the Skip Meetings mm -hmm. Forum. So so more to come. David, I want to start wrapping up, but I wanted to get your advice. You mentioned the staffing issue. Uh, so I wanted to just get your advice quickly for any young people listening, any people that are kind of looking to maybe have a career as as, as fulfilling as yours or, or at least, uh, you know, work in the business. What what what's your advice to to those that are that are younger in the industry and looking to get involved and learn and have experience different things? You know, I think, um, and it's interesting. Uh, both of my children, I have a 26 year old daughter and a 24 year old son, and without any prodding from me, both have ended up in the industry. One with a destination management company, and one with a hotel company. And 
And what has been interesting for me to observe, and this is my little microcosm, the bigger picture here, is this is an, an incredible industry. Um, I, you know, I've been able to have a career that I never expected would have been very different had I been an attorney. Um, the things that I've been exposed to, the variety of opportunities that I've uh, in, really engaged in um, is un is very unique. I have a lot of friends in a lot of different industries and they hear what we do and they're like, that sounds amazing. And it is amazing. So I, when I have an opportunity to talk to a, uh, let's say a hospitality program is I think the pandemic scared a lot of people away because they saw the impact, but you know, a lot of people went to technology. Well, that didn't prove to be all that secure. And so every industry is going to have its ups and downs. Uh, what I encourage them is to look at this as a career. Um, you know, I started as a front desk clerk at the Sitzmark Lodge in Vail, Colorado, back in 1982. That was my first introduction to hospitality, to your original question, I think, and didn't really understand. You know, when I heard about hotel sales, I was like, what is that? Am I selling a hotel? I, you know, you just didn't, I didn't get it. Um, and, but it's an amazing career. And if you think, if you look at the leaders in our industry now and you find out how they started, Everyone has a different story. A lot of people fell into it. Some actually went to hospitality programs and embarked on this as a career. But the opportunities are are really unique. You can find your passion uh, and the roles in this industry that's, that address your passions, unlike any other, right? If you want to go, as I mentioned, if you want to go on the operations side, food and beverage, uh, your project manager, you went sales, you went marketing, um, you want domestic, you want global. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. So I think uh, what I encourage and I talk to all of our employees at Merits is you can have a full career within the walls of Merits. You can have a, an amazing career within the walls of hospitality and events. And, uh, and I think it's easy to get distracted by dollars. Um, and with my own kids, I talk to them about, you know, money is important, but being fulfilled and being passionate about what you do each and every day is the ultimate payment. And that's the ultimate compensation. The money will come. Um, and so, yeah, I just read an interview with Barack Obama and he said, he's a fan of people paying their dues. And I don't, that's not real popular with uh, some of the newer generations, but I think it's still very appropriate and, and applicable is, you know, get in, learn, work hard. Uh, number one thing is network. Right, join an organization, whether it's MPI, PCMA, ASAE, site, you know, all the IAEE, the list goes on and on and on. Get involved, learn, uh, network. Um, you know, every one of those jobs I mentioned in my career uh, happened because of, of a relationship I had built in one way or another um, through that that individual network that uh, that I built, and and so it never ceases to uh, amaze me of how that pays off over time. And you may not know it today, but it'll surprise you tomorrow. So, you know, get involved, uh, roll up your sleeves, dig in, work hard. And um, and it's an amazing industry to build a career in. Excellent advice. Thank you for sharing. I want to wrap up with the last question that we ask all our guests. Uh, if you could recommend someone else that we should have on the podcast. I think you already heard me mention uh, a couple names. I mean, I think Greg Bogue, he's our uh, chief experience uh, and brand officer. Uh, Greg is one of the unique minds in the industry, and he's been a true innovator and a pioneer, I think, in event design. Um, Jim Gilmore is someone that we've partnered with for decades. Uh, Jim is an amazing brain and intellect and, and designer. Uh, and he's really helped us evolve and build our practice forward. Um, those are two that I think would be uh, really powerful uh, voices uh, for this podcast and and bring a different perspective. Um, and, and I think uh, would be strong recommendations, one internal and one external. I appreciate it. We'll take them both uh, with, with pleasure. David, it's been an absolute pleasure to speak to you. I hope everybody listening enjoyed the conversation as much as I did. As I said, David will be with us at the Skip Meetings Forum on the 27th of September in New York City. So if you're interested, let us know. David, looking forward to seeing you there and um, yeah. um, wishing you all the best in the meanwhile. Thank you, Miguel. Yeah, thank you. And I look forward to seeing you in September.